Part 1A, Taking the Test. I broke this lecture into two parts due to the density of the material and the timing. In this lecture, we'll look at the logistics and timing of taking the test. We'll also get a glimpse of what I call the core idea of clinical medicine and how it relates to algorithms. Here we go. First thing to think about with any shelf exam is the timing and the environment. Timing is an issue for me, so I've got some uh, some ways to approach that. What about the environment? You know, where are you taking this exam? Are you taking it at school? Is it one o'clock in the afternoon? Because for me, those were terrible places to be taking a standardized test, but that's that's what you're faced with. I'm a very extroverted person, and I found that being extremely introvert on test days, that set me up for success, and I just stayed in my lane and kept to myself. And the same thing with focus. You know, you meet up with your old friends, and you're all having a good time, and honestly, it just doesn't contribute to success on test day. You really need to stay in the zone, especially for a 1 p.m. test, which is unusual. The test is 110 questions. It's 2 hours, 45 minutes. The math is really simple if you break it down. I do one time through, I don't take any breaks, I don't go to the bathroom. 15 minutes, you get 10 questions for each of those 15 minutes. Uh, it's really, it's easy to keep track of this. So you should be starting question 11 when you have two hours and 30 minutes left. Question 21, I need to be starting that with two hours, 15 minutes left. 31 at two hours. That keeps my pace that keeps me honest for time throughout the duration of the test. I don't get behind. Mandatory is using a mouse. I'm going to show you guys how to do some aggressive highlighting. Get yourself a wireless mouse. Don't go anywhere without your mouse. You want to practice questions the same way you're taking the real test. Let's talk about what you see in clinic versus what you're going to see on shelf. The long story short here is that the clinic is going to have some gray areas. The test has to be black and white. So you're going to see patients in clinic that based on a textbook, they don't have that disease. Or based on a textbook, they do have that disease, but they don't actually have that disease. You're going to see some gray area. On these tests, it's black and white. Don't fool yourself. Well, I saw a patient one time with X, Y, and Z, and it didn't turn out to be that way. That's that's too subjective. They can't test that way. Everything that they test has to be objective. And the way they build these questions, they build them in reverse. They start with an answer choice. That's the correct answer, and they work backwards from that. They say, okay, what's going to be similar to this answer? What's going to distract them? Okay, let's give them a you know, a narrative that explains that answer, but let's throw in some other stuff to distract away from it. So clinic has gray areas. These test questions, they're black and white. Anemia is anemia. I had an internal med physician ask me if a patient in the hospital was anemic. I looked at the labs and I saw that the hemoglobin was low, but I knew this patient had been in the hospital for a little while and they've gotten fluids and I'm, I'm honestly just thinking that it's, it's hemodilution. I'm not real worried about it. So I was super smart and I said, no, they're not anemic. And he looked at me like I was crazy, and he said, anemia is anemia. If the patient has anemia, call it anemia. Is it microcytic? Is it normocytic? Is it macrocytic? Just because you say that this patient has anemia doesn't mean you're going to treat it. But for the sake of being objective for these test questions, anemia is anemia, and you move on. Call it what it is. Other things like signs and symptoms. So they... A test question gives you something like bowel sounds and says bowel sounds are not present. Okay, well, there's a very certain list of diagnoses that will show up on a test as bowel sounds not present. Things like ischemic bowel and upper GI obstruction uh, versus a hyperactive bowel. That's going to be a lower GI obstruction. So you can already see like upper versus lower GI. If you see hyperactive as part of the question stem, don't fool yourself. Don't get distracted. Start to think algorithmically. So I'll go into that a little bit. Some of the other objective data that you're going to encounter on this test um, are things like rash distributions, uh, lab values. I'll show you how to use lab values to your advantage. The secret is everything on these exams is objective. They don't need your subjectivity. They don't need you to get creative and come up with some wild reason as to why this disease is presenting in this new, unstudied way. That's not what they need. That's not what they're testing. 
keep everything objective. Flowcharts, you've, you've all seen them. I, I threw a few on here. Honestly, I didn't even look through them, so don't use them to study. But, um, you know, here's a foreign body in the airway type flow chart. Here's the infamous hyponatremia. This one actually is pretty helpful. Um, I haven't looked through this specific image, but you know, you need to know like, are they euvolemic? Are they hypovolemic? That changes your treatment course for hyponatremia. It also changes what you think is the problem. I've used this flow chart quite a bit. Uh, determining, do we need to do a fast exam? Do we need to get them to the OR immediately? Do we need a chest x-ray? You know, thinking algorithmically. Everyone's familiar with the ACLS algorithm. You get to a certain decision point, make your decision, and you follow that part of the chart. Here's one for thyroid. Again, these are just to, to kind of reinstate the idea that when you see a sign or a symptom, what that's doing, it's moving you down an algorithm. It's getting you a little bit closer to an answer. So the core idea for thinking algorithmically is understanding that for every single disease process, there's an etiology, a pathology, there are symptoms. Diagnosis, how do we confirm the diagnosis for this disease process? Is it imaging? Is it a lab value? Complications, okay, if we don't treat this, what happens? What are we worried about? And last but not least, treatment. This is always in a stepwise fashion. Obviously, you're starting out with conservative treatments, and there's, there's many examples for this, and we'll get into more later question types, but almost all questions stem from these core ideas right here. They might give you symptoms, and they're asking for treatment. So you've got to take these symptoms and convert it into a diagnosis. And then you have to know, okay, what is the treatment regimen for that? What's the first step in treating this disease? Or they might give you a diagnostic study, and then they might ask you what the pathology behind this disease is. So again, you've, you've got this diagnostic study. Oh, that's how we diagnose disease X. Okay, what's the pathology for that disease? This is where everything's stemming from. The reason this is important, if a question pops up and you recognize the symptoms and you get the disease process correct, you knew that part. What I missed was the treatment. Man, I, I nailed. I knew that it was multiple sclerosis. I totally missed you know, what the first line treatment was for multiple sclerosis. In your notes, do not study the diagnosis or what the symptoms of multiple sclerosis look like. For you in that question, you need to study what's the treatment for multiple sclerosis. You've become more efficient in how you're doing these questions, how you're studying. Now that we have the structure of the test and we understand what it means to be objective, let's learn to go through the questions systematically in part 1b.